Good morning, you guys. I am back. We are at Epworth this morning on this beautiful, bright, gorgeous Sunday morning. So I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, we are going to spend a little bit more time today just kind of sharing what's going to happen in worship in about an hour here uh, as we have people come in. And um, we are in a regular worship routine now at Epworth, so I'm, I'm excited about that. I hope everybody's having a great weekend. Uh, we didn't have quite the flooding we thought we were going to have, at least not not in, I haven't seen it, we didn't have it here, so that was great. Anyway, I hope all of you guys are doing well. Um, this morning I asked the question, imagine how would you feel if somebody read all your text messages? And uh, this morning we're going to talk about uh, the concept that, that God knows everything about you and loves you anyway. And so that's our message for this morning. We're going to spend some time um, in the Word uh, talking about this conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. Good morning, Stephanie. Good to see you, my friend. I'm going to call you we're gonna to try to get together maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday anyway I'll call you um, anyway so let's pray together and then we'll get into the word let's pray holy God thank you so much for this morning thank you for just a gorgeous day another opportunity to be in your presence and to be together uh, through the power of your spirit Lord we just ask that you would speak to our hearts and minds this morning that you would teach us mold us move us and then use us Lord in Jesus name we pray amen uh, in the interest of time, I am not going to read the whole passage of scripture this morning. I'm going to tell you the story, but just to kind of kick off the conversation this morning about, uh, I asked the question, how would you feel if somebody read all your text messages? And, and, and you know, the truth is that most of us um, don't necessarily want somebody knowing every single th thing that we talk about or everything we say or everything we think or everything we do. Hey, Andy, good morning. Uh, and I, I brought, brought that up this morning because, uh, you know, a couple days ago, um, I had done, I had had a conversation with my husband um, about um, some equipment and things that we needed to buy for the church. I had had that conversation. The next day, I was on my phone, and all of a sudden, I'm getting advertisements for the very equipment that we had had a conversation about. And same thing when I got to church the next day on a completely different system and a completely different network and on my own computer, I'm again getting these advertisements, which tells me Big Brother is listening. Hey, good morning, George and Susie, and good morning, Bonnie. Good to see you guys here this morning. Good morning, Rosalie. Uh, anyway, so so it made me, you know, that whole 1984 thing of Big Brother is watching, and I, in my case, it's Big Sister because it's... Alexa. We have that uh, one of those Alexa um, Amazon speakers in our house that and we have like a smart house. We say, Alexa, turn the heat up or turn the air up. Uh, Alexa, turn the lights on. Um, Alexa, play some music. And um, and she does that. And but she also is listening all the time. <laughs> so that makes me kind of nervous. And it got me thinking about um, times as a uh, Andy says, I think I would have to put a lot of inside jokes into context. <laughs> yeah, I don't necessarily want everyone hearing all my conversations. And have you ever sent a text message to the wrong person? I've done that. I, I remember not too long ago, my sister and I were, were kind of, you know, talking about my mom in not necessarily a nice way. And my sister in, uh, inadvertently sent one of those messages to my mom and really hurt her feelings. And so sometimes you have to be, <laughs> Andy says, says, Alexa just went off. Hey, Alexa, turn Andy's lights off. <laughs> hey, Jan, good morning. Um, she loves the story of the woman at the well, and that's what we are going to talk about this morning. But just to kind of kick that off, the, the concept of somebody knowing everything about you. Let me just tell you guys, and I've told some of you guys the story that when I was a youth pastor, I had, you know, I had hundreds and hundreds of kids that I interact with via text message and using my phone. And so it was not rare for me to occasionally get a text message that a student had sent inadvertently. They had sent it to, tried to send it to a friend and they ended up sending it to me. And it was kind of funny because at times it really kind of would bust them. Like I remember sitting next to a student leader one time, a Young Life student leader at a football game, and she sent a message to me and I read it and it said, no, I don't want to get drunk tonight. I, I don't want to drink tonight. I got too wasted last night which was, uh, that violated the conduct code that we had for student leader. And she had sent that to me by accident. I looked at her and said, really? And uh, that was an embarrassing situation for her. Um, and, and because she basically, uh, ra uh, you know, outed herself on her, fact that she was violating that code of conduct and that that covenant relationship that we had. And uh, another time, this was really, really crazy. I had a student one time that for almost a month or several weeks, I got every single solitary text message that she sent to anybody, I got a copy of it. And so I knew exactly what was going on in her life every minute for, for weeks. And I, she was not, it was dangerous. She was doing very dangerous things. And I was very concerned really for her safety and for her life and actually had to respond to it because I'm required by law when I think a child is in a bad situation. 
Um, she was 15 at the time. And uh, that was a horrible situation, but, it, but, but I knew everything that was going on in her life because I got copies of every single one of her text messages for weeks. Now just imagine how you would feel and what you, most of us don't necessarily want that. Andy said, I actually sent an acute good morning message to for Amber Wilson Bermudez to my older son. <laughs> he was not impressed. Acute. Uh, I like the way you phrased that. Um, yeah, I bet not. <laughs> Be careful what you put in writing because um, they do sometimes get it into the wrong hands, whether we do it on purpose or not, um, and, and whether Alexis or li is listening or, or whoever is listening. Um, I, I share that with you guys this morning because we're going to read a story about a woman who um, was had some things to hide in her life, and, uh, and yet she had this conversation with Jesus, and in that conversation, she discovered that Jesus knew everything about her and, uh, and, and actually told her everything she ever did. She, those were her words. And this is in uh, John 4, and it's a very well-known story. It's a story of Jesus and this woman at the well. And I'm not going to read the whole story. Just in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the whole story, but I would encourage you to go and read it. The part I'm going to talk about today is in John 4, and it starts in verse 5. And I'm going to read through about verse 30, and then I'm going to skip ahead just to verse 39. I, there's a little bit that happens with Jesus and his disciples in the middle, but I want to just really focus on the conversation between Jesus and this woman and the results of that conversation. And just to let you know, in this conversation, we're told that Jesus is traveling and he goes through Samaria, which was uh, something that a Jewish person didn't always do. Samaritans and Jews uh, really clashed. It was deep racism and deep cultural differences, ethnic differences, and there was this, uh, this deep division between the two of them, and they did not think well of each other, and the Jews actually really looked down on the Samaritans. And you know, we live in a time in America where there's a lot of racism and a lot of things going on where there is, there's, we've talked about the division between blacks and whites or African Americans and whites. And, um, and, and, and actually people of color, uh, you know, you could also say Asians and whites and you could say Middle Eastern people and whites. There, there has been great racism and great division in, in our country and throughout the world, historically, for, since, since the dawn of history. And uh, there has been, and, and it has hurt our country, and there's a lot of division in our country, a lot of anger because of it. And so just imagine that kind of a culture. That's how it was between Jews and Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans would not interact, and a Jewish person literally thought a Samaritan person was unclean. So they would actually go around Samara, Samaria when they were traveling. Well, Jesus chose not to do that. So he went through Samaria, and, and in the midst of, of his travels, he stopped at this well known as Jacob's Well, um, uh, the patriarch Jacob dug this well and so that it's known as Jacob's well and so Jesus sits down at Jacob's well and we're told that it's the sixth hour and that's important because what that means is the first hour would be sunrise it would start at sunrise so if that started at sunrise somewhere around six o'clock six thirty that means that six hours later it would about noon twelve thirty so in the middle of the heat of the day in a desert community Jesus is sitting at this well, resting, and this woman comes up. And I, that immediately tells us something about this woman. It would have been very rare for a person to come to the well. And, and, and going to the well was a task that you, most people had to do at least once a day and most of the time twice a day. And so she had come by from a neighboring village and she had come to this well. And normally people would come to the well early, early in the morning before it got hot or late in the evening as the sun was starting to go down as the temperature had cooled off. And that was not only an easier time and a more comfortable time to come that was the popular time and that would be the time that people would want to go there because they would want the relationship it was a time of fellowship and socialization and interacting with your neighbors and your friends and it, and it was a it was kind of a fun time uh, or a fun way to do a task for some reason, this woman did not go at those times. And I think we can assume from that, and we learned later a little bit more about her story, that she went to the well at the sixth hour in the heat of the day because she wasn't welcome to come in the morning or in the evening. And probably not only wasn't welcome, but was, uh, was going to be very criticized and very ridiculed. And we find out later it's because she has had a number of husbands, a number of relationships. She's been divorced uh, five times, and now she's living with somebody that is not her husband. Jesus kind of exposes that in her later and, and we're going to talk about that but that would have meant that she would have been really looked down on by that society she would have been considered at the minimum an adulterer because she had had these broken relationships and then gotten remarried she but something was definitely you know she had essentially been thrown out or thrown away by several husbands and now she was with this man that wasn't her husband that was just unheard of it wasn't allowed in that society so she would be considered impure 
she would be considered um, a, a great sinner and a and a uh, a person who was almost like a prostitute, um, very promiscuous and very looked down on, and would probably be ridiculed um, and possibly even violently ridiculed and abused um, verbally, but also maybe physically if she came around other people or tried to share the well with them. Think about in the '60s, uh, an African American person or a black person using a water fountain that was designated just for whites. Um, I remember watching the movie The Help, and uh, it was very important to the white people that this their black servant did not use the same bathroom as them because they felt like there was disease, that they carried disease and that, that, that they were so um, unclean and, and so substandard as human beings that they didn't even want to share the same toilet. Isn't that crazy? Um, we can't get our minds around that. But that's kind of the same attitude. That's how this woman would have been treated. So we're told she comes to this well and Jesus, and obviously, um, has broken relationships in her life and all and, and and is isolated and probably feels some loneliness and Jesus is sitting at this well and Jesus does something extraordinary he speaks to this woman and he says would you get me something to drink and uh and that it was extraordinary you guys because first of all he was talking to this woman that other people wouldn't talk to he initiated a conversation with somebody that nobody else would initiate a conversation with but not only that he was a Jew and she even says how is it that a Jew, a you, a Jewish man would ask me for a drink? That's extraordinary because a Jew would never ever speak to a Samaritan. A Jewish man would never take the initiative to speak directly to a woman who was not his wife um, unless he was, you know, she was a servant in the household or something like that. A random stranger, that would never be done and absolutely never to a Samaritan. For him to even speak to her at all when others wouldn't was, was out of the ordinary. But what was really extraordinary was he was asking her for a drink and she said, you don't have anything to draw from the well from. In other words, you would have to drink out of my container. That's like using my own toilet. You would not share a drink from my container. You wouldn't want my germs. I'm a Samaritan. So that was extraordinary. And so that is like the first point that I wanna make this morning is that Jesus doesn't care what anybody else thinks about you. Jesus doesn't care what your status is in the community. Jesus doesn't care how other people might look down on you or how you might be judged. Jesus doesn't care what you did. Jesus wants to be in a relationship with you. Jesus cares enough to break down all those barriers and and interact with you, you are risen to the level of somebody valuable to Jesus, no matter who you are and what you've done. Um, you know, uh, my friend Frank was always quoting Billy Graham, who said, I don't know who you are and what you've done. I do know that Jesus loves you. And that's our first point that we get from this story is that Jesus uh, wants to lift you to a level of great value, value enough for him to interact with you. And you are pure and you are, you are somebody worth uh, interacting with and worth sharing with. And he is not afraid of whatever uncleanness others might judge in you and others might, might pin on you. Uh, whatever sin you might think you have, whatever sin you do have in your life, it doesn't matter to Jesus. You are valuable to him and he wants to lift you up. And that's extraordinary. And when we realize that, uh, like this woman, all of a sudden Jesus catches her attention and they start having this conversation. And Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's asking you for a drink, you would be asking me for a drink because I can give you living water. And I'm paraphrasing that, but that's essentially what the conversation is. And in that, Jesus is saying, if you knew the gift of God, and what he's talking about is exactly what we had talked about last week, that the word has now become flesh, that God has now chosen to gift to the world this great and amazing rec rescue story that happens in the person of Jesus. Christ. If you knew that I am he, I am the man in the flesh, I am God incarnate in the world, I am the word become flesh. If you knew that, you would know to ask me for a drink because I can give you something deeper than the water. And that's where Jesus gets a little, he talks about in uh, metaphors and parables all the time. And this is one of those situations where Jesus is talking about something is that is a daily need. We need daily to have water. She has to come to that well day in and day out to get water. It is necessary for life and it is something that she is constantly striving for. And now he's kind of using symbolism and using this the metaphor of the well and the water to say you've got a deeper need in your life. You have something that you keep striving for and you keep going to this well of relationships and it's not working for you. You have to go find another one and another one because there's an emptiness in you that I know about. And I have something that can touch you and heal you on a deeper level and it can heal you not just for now but for eternity it is like a living water that will never go away i can offer you that 
So that's my second point, is that Jesus looks be beneath the surface of our struggle and the surface of, of our needs to the deeper need and the deeper hurt and the deeper pain and the deeper emptiness that we have. And he offers to heal that, not just to give us what we need on the surface for the here and now, but to give us something deeper and something uh something that will fill us more completely. It's a spiritual thirst, a spiritual hunger that he is willing to heal and he was he is willing and he that's what he came for. And so no matter who we are, he loves us and he will lift us up, but not no matter who we are and what we hunger for, he knows that the deeper need is a brokenness in our relationship with God and that that is what causes us to do all these harmful things in our lives because what we really need, what we really thirst for is a spiritual relationship with God. And so he goes to that deeper level. And so he has this conversation with this woman and, and he tells her, I can give you something, uh, uh, living water that will well up in you. And see what he's talking about then is I will give you something that will change you from the inside out. I will fill you with something that can pour out, that can transform you from the inside out, that can pour out and change your whole life for eternity. That'll never go away. It's a wholeness. It's a fullness that literally will overflow in your life. And he's offering that to her. And he said, you'll never be thirsty again. Once that is welling up, that 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 sense of joy, that sense of wholeness, that sense of fullness, once that is welling up inside of you, and that's a spiritual uh, feeding, that's a, that's a spiritual pouring out of, of water, which is spiritual water or love and compassion and connection with God. Once you have that welling up inside of you, then you'll never feel that emptiness that you feel right now. You'll never have to thirst for that again. And, and she, it's kind of funny. I think she does what most humans do. She kind of backs away and doesn't want to get that first personal and get that deep. So she says, oh, wow, you know, give me that water because I'm tired of coming to this well, especially in the heat of the day. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to never have to come to the well again. She just kind of makes it light and keeps it at the surface. And I, I think, I think it's great what Jesus does right here. He basically takes the gloves off and he says, you know what? Go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, yeah, you've had five husbands. And the one that you have right now is not, that you're with right now is not your husband. And what Jesus does is he's holding up a mirror to that woman. He says, look in the mirror and look at what you're really doing. You are thirsty for something. You are searching for something and you're looking for love. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. And it's the well of re relationships and looking for love that you're constantly going back to. This is not about water. This is about love. This is about hurt in your heart. This is about an emptiness in your life that you keep going back to the same thing of different relationships trying to find value and you're just not finding it you need something deeper admit it and that's what he's doing by holding up that that mirror and you know uh she, she kind of backs away from him and i think so many of us do that in our lives you know we cannot be healed by jesus we cannot be filled by jesus if we're not willing to admit the emptiness in our own lives if we always kind of want to go oh i'm a good person i'm a good person i'm okay you guys it's not about being a good person you know what none of us are good people the reality is in uh in romans 3 23 all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god none of us are good people we are all broken we're all sinners in the need of grace all of us have some sort of emptiness in our lives lives um, where we are separated from God and there is something missing and all of us have some kind of well that we go to. Maybe it's power, maybe it's authority, maybe it's money, maybe it's relationships like this woman was going to, maybe it's substances, who knows, maybe it's just, just this anger. Right now I think so many people are just so angry um, and, and, and there, it, it's a sign of what, something missing and an emptiness in us. And until we are willing to look in the mirror and admit it to ourselves that we need grace, that we are hungry, that we are thirsty for something, that there is a spiritual emptiness, until we are willing to admit that to Jesus and come to Jesus with us, we cannot be filled. We cannot receive that living water. We will not have that welling up inside of us because we won't admit that we need it. And that's what Jesus is doing with this woman. He's helping her see herself for who she really is and to admit uh, what she needs. And she kind of then, I think, re just explains to Jesus, you know, now she knows that he's talking on a spiritual level. And she says, you know what? I'm confused by religion, you know, uh, we used to be told that we can worship on this mountain, but now the Jews say we have to worship in Jerusalem. Which is it? I don't, religion isn't doing it for me. It's confusing to me. I don't understand uh, the rules and the boundaries. Maybe when the Messiah comes, there is something out there. Maybe when the Messiah comes, he'll help me figure it out because right now it doesn't make any sense to me. And, uh, and Jesus says, you know what? You're right. I am here. 
And he says, the time has, the time is coming. And matter of fact, the time has come when it's not going to be about religion and it's not going to be about rules and it's not going to be about ritual rituals. It's going to be about spirit and truth. And he says, and that time has come because I'm here now. And it's not anymore about religion. Now it's about spirit and truth. And what he means is it's about what's happening inside of you. What's the condition of your heart? Who are you truly? Like we've been talking about with Christian character. Who are you really? Who are you surrendered to really? What's the condition of your heart really? So it's not about your relationships. It's not about what's on the outside. It's not about what people think about you. It's who you really are from the inside out. It's about your spirit and your truth. Are you being spiritually filled by the presence and the power of God in your life, minute by minute, day by day? Are you living in the truth and the knowledge of a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you truly surrendered to God? Is God truly the Lord of your life? That's what's important, not your religion and not your ritual. And that's what he's telling her there. I think that's powerful. Those are powerful, powerful words. So he says that to this woman, and it's astounding what this woman does. And this is the part I really do want to read for you. If you, uh, he says that to her, and it's like all of a sudden when he says, I am he, um, all of a sudden she's blown away by that. And, she, and watch what she does. She says, then, this is in verse 28. It says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And then skip ahead to verse 39. And it says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. You guys think about that for a minute. She had this encounter with Christ and Christ exposed to herself her deep need and her deep, her deep hurt. First, he valued her, and then he offered her to, to heal her brokenness, and then he showed her exactly the source of her, her brokenness, and then he said, this isn't about religion. This is about spirit and truth. And, and when she recognized that all of a sudden he said, I am he, and she realized, you know, this is, this is God in front of me. And she probably couldn't explain that. All we, she knew right then was she dropped her, her uh, jug or, or her whatever she was going to get water with. She, you know, she had come in the heat of the day to avoid people, dropped her jug, and ran back to the very people that she had been avoided, the very people who had judged her and persecuted her, who had um, excluded her and, and, and put her down. Those people, she ran with great haste right back to those people, and all she did was say, you guys have got to come see this guy. This guy told me everything I ever did. All she did was tell them her her experience with Jesus and something about her and something about her telling caused them to come and see. And when they came and saw, they also became followers of Jesus. Guys, we cannot miss that. God loves us no matter what we've done. God values us no matter what, we do, what we've done. Jesus wants to heal us from the inside out and fill us in the deepest part of our emptiness and our hurt. He wants to fill that. And it's a matter of spirit and, in tru and truth. He wants to transform us from the inside out. And when we have that encounter with Christ and when he does that in our lives, we are compelled to go tell people about it. And we don't have to have a seminary education. We don't have to know deep theology. All we have to do is go and tell people what we've experienced in Jesus and let them see the transformation in our lives and they will also come to Christ. Guys, I don't know where all of you are in your relationship with Jesus. I don't know uh, what you go to every day. I know all of us have something, some kind of well that we go to every day other than Jesus Christ to make our lives feel meaningful and to fill ourselves and, to, and feel good about ourselves. Jesus knows it. Jesus knows all that you've done. He knows any sin that you carry with you. He knows all your deep, dark secrets. He knows more than Alexa in your life. <laughs> And he loves you anyway, and he died on the cross for you anyway, and he wants to heal you. He wants to pour into you a living water that will never go away so that you will never spiritually thirst again. He wants to fill your life with real relationship, real joy, uh, real fullness, and real purpose. Uh, and not only that, God wants to use you. Jesus wants to mold you and transform you from the inside out so that then you can go out into the world and share him with others. Uh, I don't know who you are or where you are. I do know that Jesus loves you. So drink deeply from the well of the Messiah and then go out into a world that is thirsting and hungry for God and share him, invite them to Jesus. Let's pray. 
Holy God, I thank you so much for this just great story and this great example of how much we are valued by you and by Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for sending the word in the flesh. Thank you for offering in a, a, a way to fill us and fill our emptiness, Lord. Help us to surrender and see ourselves as we really are and to surrender to the power and presence and the transformation of Jesus in our lives. And then, Lord, use us, use us to tell others and to invite others to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Guys, what else do we need to pray for today? I'm going to see a couple of these um, messages. Patty said, oh, hey, Tammy, good morning, and hi, Patty. Uh, Tammy says, thank you so much for the reminder. Pastor Sonny reminds me of the song, Fill My Cup, Lord, let me know if you want the words. You can search for the lyrics. So that's a good song. You're right. Um, oh, she sent me the words. Thank you, Patty. I'll, I'll look at it in a second. Andy said, I'm always telling people that being a Christian is not religion, but a relationship with God. Most times they're surprised when I say that. Yeah, it is not about ri religious ritual. Um, it's about a relationship. It's about surrender. It's about letting the Holy Spirit pour into you. You know, religion um, and practicing worship becomes so easy when it's an outflow of your relationship with Christ. And I, I think that's why we see that so oftentimes where people are just sold out, deep surrender, and they just worship any way they feel comfortable, whatever, whatever. you know, TJ's like that. He just is sold out. You can see it. Body says, great point. The best sharing of Jesus is to tell people what he's done in your life. Absolutely. You guys, um, you guys know that, that when, I, when I preach, I tell my own story because that's the story I know. That's the story I know the best. So tell your own story and tell, tell how Jesus has, has um, transformed your life and let your story point to Jesus' story. Let's get some prayer requests here. Tammy says, let's pray for law enforcement. Yeah, let's do that right now. Holy God, thank you so much for all of those who have given their lives and dedicated their lives um, to protect us and to keep order in our society, Lord. We ask, they're going through a rough time. There's been a lot of criticism because there is always, anytime there is a situation where there is one or two people um, uh, who do things selfishly in any organization, that, that reflects on the whole organ, organization. There's so much anger towards law enforcement, Lord. So I would just ask that you would protect their hearts, uh, that you would uh, help us to be encouragers, uh, lift them up today, Lord, and, and keep them safe. Um, keep them safe from cr criticism and from um, discouragement, but keep them safe physically from harm, Lord. We just, we just ask that you would... Um, that you would be that you would lift up all in law enforcement today in Jesus name we pray amen Prayers for our friend Cindy Lynch. She is struggling this week. Yeah, I, I haven't talked to Cindy this week, you guys, but I, I'm trying to keep track of her and been praying for her regularly. Cindy's my sweet friend, and she's got a lot of health issues, um, some pressure in her brain from many surgeries and, and shunts. And so, yeah, let's pray for um, let's pray for Cindy. Holy God, I just lift up Cindy to you this morning. I ask once again that I, first of all, I thank you and praise you for the sweet blessing of her friendship um, for many of us there in, in here today. And I, I just ask that you would continue to, to watch over and guide and direct her and heal her. Give her strength, give her perseverance, uh, help her to get the answers that she needs. But more than anything, Lord, I ask that in the name and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, that you would ease her pain right here and now this morning. Help her to feel your presence, help her to feel your strength, help her to know that you love her and that we love her and lift her. Um, with that knowledge of the power of the Holy Spirit. When two or more are gathered, you are there. So we are gathering in your spirit to lift up Cindy, help her to feel your presence and our presence and our love and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bonnie says, please pray for Mary Lee. I will tell you guys that Mary Lou, she's a member of our church and Mary Lee had some surgery and had some tests done and they came back benign. So she is fine. She was very excited about that. So now she just has to heal from the surgery, which is hard and she's she's hurting, but we have, but she's she's got a great prognosis ahead of her, which is really good. So let's 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 praise God for that and, and ask God to continue watching over Mary Lee. Let's pray. Holy God, we lift up Mary Lee to you this morning, and we thank you and praise you for that great news that she got last week. We thank you and praise you uh, that things went well and that she is in very good uh, hands with her doctors, Lord. We ask that you would continue to strengthen and encourage her and, and heal her body, bring her back to 100% um, health uh, so that she can be back with us. We thank you for her friendship. We thank you for her presence in our community of faith, Lord, and we just thank you for all that you are doing in her life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to pray with me. We have some church meetings, you know, and I I, I, I don't know if you guys heard that the you know, Virginia Conference was supposed to have our virtual uh, annual conference yesterday, and we made it about 10 minutes into that before we started having problems, and by noon they had uh, suspended that conference. Um, it just didn't work out. So I, I would actually just 
ask that we would pray for to encourage those in leadership that are that are very discouraged by that I think but also that 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 God would guide our our conference as we make decisions and also we are getting into charge conference season and there's lots of meetings we have lots of meetings at Epworth this week and lots of decisions being made so so I just want to pray that we could surrender our churches um, to Jesus and, and let him have his way with all of us let's pray for that Lord God I lift up um, First of all, the Virginia Conference, uh, many of us that are on this and many uh, are, are United Methodists and, and um, it's a frustrating time as conferences have had to be changed and we've tried to have a new conference and it didn't work out, Lord. And so I ask, first of all, that you would bring peace and comfort and, and encouragement to all of those that are frustrated, that feel like they failed yesterday, that you would lift them up and help them to, to not feel responsible and not feel um, condemned, that they would feel encouraged and that they would know that they are, they are doing the best they can. And they made a good, um, a very difficult decision, but it was probably the right decision and it was a good decision so I just ask that you would encourage them open the doors and work out the details for that conference to go forward if it needs to and if it doesn't and we just have to wait till next year Lord we just ask that you would give everyone a sense of peace um, and, and trust in you in that uh, decisions that need to be made would they be made effectively and correctly um, and may you be glorified in all of that Lord we also lift up all of our churches uh, facing charge conference season and and decisions that we have to make whether it's opening churches or or who's going to be in leadership and what kind of leadership's decisions are going to be made we ask for um, community we ask for um, strong relationships we ask for a sense of purpose and and uh, unity in our churches and we ask that you would um, appoint the right leaders and the right um, those that are supposed to make decisions and, and are supposed to be in leadership and on leaders, leadership committees lord we ask that you would allow those committees to be productive and that they you would guide and direct all that they do and all the decisions that they made and that and that you would strengthen our churches and then god we just give you the churches we ask that and I, i'm speaking for epworth and i know there's people from beach methodist on here in Oak Grove and other churches, Lord, I just ask that you would use us, mold us, move us, take our churches and do with those churches and those church communities, whatever you need to do to, uh, to grow the kingdom and to, to, to lead others to Christ. Help us to be people who make disciples through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> guys, that's it. That's all I have this morning. I got to go get ready for a service. So I'm going to just pray over you guys and, uh, and, and tell you to have a great day. And I, I will see you on Tuesday as we continue with Christian character, talking about what it means to have the love of Christ. And we're going to talk about um, strategies for being tenderhearted like Jesus. So that's where we'll be on Tuesday. I hope you'll join us. Let's pray together. Holy God, thanks again for this message. Thanks again for the, for the presence of Jesus and this conversation between Jesus and this woman. Lord, transform our lives equally. Try uh, meet us in our places of emptiness and need, Lord, and then fill us and then send us out into the world and use us. Father, today, uh, give us divine appointments. Give us people to speak to, people to love, people to encourage. Help us to be forces of good and positive grace and mercy and encouragement in the world around us. Bring unity to our world. Heal our planet. Heal our country. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you guys, I'll see you on Tuesday. God bless you. Have a great day and great rest of your weekend. I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in.